thank you, Jim. Uh, happy to be here, and it's no accident, but uh, the previous two speakers sort of have set me up pretty nicely because they gave all the background. I say it's no accident because this project uh, really sort of came out of the early days of the Concrete Coalition concern. And of course, Jack, as you can see, is, is on our committee uh, developing 78, so many of the things, many of his opinions or uh, research have fed into our study. So you can see the Project Manager Committee, Jack and uh, Professor Abby Lyle from uh, University of Colorado, an engineer in Southern California, many of you know Mike Moraine, and one from Seattle, Peter Summers, are the working group. We've had many students help us. Much of the information or data that we have used has come from these IDAs. That's why I asked Jack to describe what an AD is, a IDA is, because it takes you know, five minutes of my talk to do it, I thought he could do it, you know, better. Um, so the outline I'll give is a little bit of background uh, for ATC 78. This has been uh, funded by FEMA, and they've been very patient because we're going into our fifth year. I think FEMA thought we'd have this done in maybe three years max, or maybe shorter. Turned out it's a pretty difficult problem, much more difficult, I think, than any of us realized. Uh, we have a complete methodology for frame buildings, and that doesn't mean moment frames, it just means buildings with columns and slabs or columns and beams. You know, many of the buildings that Craig pointed out that were built in the 20s really doesn't have, don't have a lateral system, they're just a lot of columns. And we also realize that most buildings have walls, so please, nobody raise their hand and say, do you know most buildings have walls? Yes, we do. But that's a real hard problem. <laughs> frames are just hard. Walls are real hard. So we're working on that now. Uh, we have done some calibration of the system, and uh, some additional is going on uh, as we speak. So then we, we are in the early development of dealing, uh, sticking walls in these frame buildings. So uh, Craig has gone over all this. The Concrete Coalition you know, has raised concerns way back in 2005 and six, and it was formed. But the third bullet here, the early discussion include the observation that also very vulnerable damage, only a relatively small percentage will collapse. Craig and Jack both have gone over that. So the real issue is how do you identify those that we really think are gonna collapse from a policy standpoint so those could be either taken out of service or fixed first. Um, the, the evaluation standards that we have, uh, God bless them, uh, ASC 31 and 41, now mostly 41, uh, fail a far larger percentage of buildings, probably because it's called life safety and not collapse prevention. But in any case, if you're talking about pass fail, they fail a lar much larger percentage of buildings than we have seen collapse, particularly concrete buildings. And there's no guideline or practical technique available to identify the subset of buildings that we really think um, are likely to collapse and way back when the Concrete Coalition called these killer buildings. So everyone always says, well, these evaluation standards fail too many buildings, but here's some data that actually shows that. This is the OSHPD hospital evaluations of buildings. They were all done, as you know, uh, very consistently because you have to get your evaluation approved by OHPD. So it's a, it's a literal translation of ASE 31, and this is just the data, but these are the, the break off between buildings that um, might collapse or that fail ASE 31 and those that don't. And the statistics here is that of all the hospitals that were evaluated, uh, increased 76 buildings. 82% failed ASC 31. Another study that we uh, helped with, and many engineers in the room might have worked with, and that's the courthouse, California courthouse evaluation. They had over 300 buildings, and it was a very controlled uh, engineering study because they wanted everything consistent, so we used ASC 31, and all the engineers collaborated to try to do them in the same way. And in this case, there was a benchmark that we were looking at, uh, you know, from the code standpoint, and all three bench uh, mark buildings considered, 73% failed uh, that study. 
And if you look specifically at concrete buildings, just looking at C1, C2, and C3 at the top, these are the model building types and the number of buildings uh, uh, that fail. And uh, this is just a blow up of that top area. So the, the total, uh, as you can see, of C1, C2, and C3s in that database, 75% fail. So it's, it's not, uh, there is data to indicate that we probably can't fix all of the concrete buildings that fail ASC 31. And if you're only talking about collapse, uh, which a lot of people are worried about damage and dollars, that's a whole different thing. But if you're only talking about public life safety, it's probably not justified uh, to retrofit all those buildings. So what are our project objectives of ATC 78, which is now in its fifth year? Well, we were we were want to identify high risk buildings within the concrete uh, subset. Our goal was to be efficient and inexpensive, because as Craig said, you know you could spend used to be eighty thousand. Now we're talking about fifty thousand, maybe less, to do a nonlinear time history analysis or something that gets you beyond uh, ASC thirty one or forty one evaluations. But uh, it's very hard to get. Uh, a political jurisdiction to require all the owners of every concrete building to spend $75,000 and find out that only a few of them needed retrofit. So we, we tried to avoid nonlinear analysis for many reasons, and we even tried to uh, avoid an overall building analysis. Our desire was really to rank buildings on the likelihood of collapse to enable identification of those that have a very high probability of collapse. And if we could come up with some measure that was related to the probability of collapse, that would kind of be the ideal uh, answer uh, to this problem. Because the other difficult thing that FEMA is going to force us to do, which we haven't done, I keep pushing it off every year, uh, five years I managed to push it off, and that's to set a cutoff. So if, we, if our answer is coming out 30% or 40% or 50% of collapse, FEMA wants to say, well, what's okay? And I'm, avoiding that, but eventually I'll probably have to deal with it. Um, and in our case, unlike ASE 41 and most other evaluation techniques, our collapse should not be defined, should be defined as a global story or building collapse, not failure of a component. So if a beam, you know, gets uh, overstrained or something, that does not, that should not be a collapse. We're talk we want to be talking about something that's actually measuring collapse. So what alternatives have we considered? We've been working on this for five years. Well, the first thing that you would think of is, well, let's do it by building type. Uh, Craig Cole Martin and others have studied the buildings that actually collapse, and maybe we can figure out what deficiencies there are, and you just do a verbal description of the building, and if it's this type of building and this high, and it has a discontinuous wall or whatever it is, you know, that, that's going to be a dangerous building. Well, that, that was studied in some detail, uh, and we actually just couldn't figure out a way to do it. Uh, we couldn't figure out a way to do it with any reliability, um, because strength is almost always, strength is important, uh, strength is almost always important, and if you just look at building types, you're kind of throwing out the, the window uh, strength or, or other uh, analytical uh, characteristics of the building. So. Uh, we also figured out that many deficiencies uh, are not seen. You know, they're, they're reinforcing deficiencies, so you can't just look at a building. You look at two frames, one of which is, has shear critical columns. Uh, you can't see that on the outside. You've got to do some kind of calculation uh, right off the bat. So this, uh, this system of just looking at buildings uh, uh, from the outside, we, we decided it was too inaccurate. Uh, in order to make the difference between someone spending two million dollars to retrofit their building and, and not. Another way uh, we have looked at and studied in some detail, that's where the, the collapse uh, tablecloth that Jack showed came from all our analysis. We tried to assign weights to known deficiencies. Craig showed the 10 top deficiencies. We started looking at those and using these IDA analysis to try to figure out uh, what the fragilities were under different conditions. And we worked on that actually for a couple of years. There's a report uh, that we finally came out with uh, that, that chronicled all of our studies of these different deficiencies. But basically, the conclusion of that report was 
we can't figure out a way to use this in any kind of a, of a systematic uh, evaluation process. So we didn't go there. Uh, there were too many deficiencies, and if you try to com combine the deficiencies uh, and try to figure out if you have uh, various aspects of the deficiency put together, how does that change the collateral probability? It got way, way too complicated. So finally we said, well, you know, the real thing that causes collapse, in our opinion, is drift. So let's figure out a, a rapid and approximate engineering analysis uh, that will give us drift demands, and from there, maybe we can come up with a collapse probability. And uh, in the end, this is what we have developed, uh, and that's what I'm going to describe. Uh, how, how do we think this might be used? Well, we can't dictate how this might be used. We have talked to LA Building Department a little bit about uh, the possibility that they might use this system. One of the reasons they came up with it for the long period of time is that all the engineers were telling them, if you wait a little bit, three years, five years, 10 years, there's going to be new and better ways of analyzing buildings and ways to retrofit them, and it won't be so costly. So, you know, give us, give us some time to get our act together. So we're suggesting that uh, all these old, older buildings, pre-1976 UBC, simply be classified as high seismic risk buildings. That's all of them, because they are all highly vulnerable to damage. Um, but we would use the, our evaluation method to rank the buildings uh, in the inventory according to a rating that is a function of the probability of collapse. Uh, my esteemed colleague, Jack Maley, hates for me to say it's actually the probability of collapse because this is an approximate method, but it's certainly, uh, if you look at one building, it comes out 20%, and one building comes out 50%, you know that the 50% building has got a higher probability of collapse. Whether it's exactly two and a half times higher, that's something else. So somehow you would select a portion of all of these buildings uh, and take the ones with the highest probability of collapse, and we arbitrarily are calling them exceptionally high-risk seismic buildings, and those are the buildings that uh, LA or some city would say, dear owner, you have to retrofit these buildings. And if you didn't want to accept any concrete, older concrete building because of its high damage probability, uh, uh, you, you could simply uh, make these uh, uh, different classifications for years. So if you had the highest grouping of probability of collapse, you say you got 10 years or 5 years or 7 years. Lower probability of collapse, you still got to fix your building, but it's 20 years or 25 years or something like that. As I say here, kiddingly, uh, alternately, you can select the cutoff and say everybody does this analysis and everybody that has over a 40% chance of collapse by our method has to retrofit the building or something. So there are many different ways you can do it, do it in that uh, way. Uh, so when we started on this uh, idea of using drift as an engineering demand parameter, we said uh, it's kind of going to be complicated. Uh, let's just start with frames. There are certainly uh, less configurations with frames than there are when you start adding walls. And uh, so we just we said we realize there's not that many frame buildings, but they're probably more susceptible to collapse, and let's use those. And as again, when I said frames, I'm simply mean columns in, in a horizontal structure, flat slab, waffle slab, beam. We don't care if it's designed for lateral or it's not designed for lateral. All the columns are, are in the bin for us to calculate, as Jack said. And again, I, that's why I said it's no accident that my presentation in 78 is consistent because Jack is on the project. So we all decided the columns were pretty important uh, for, for that particular uh, purpose. So all frames in the building may be considered in a con contribution to strength and potential collapse. And we got lateral frames, gravity frames, column beam frames, column slab frames, all of those different uh, conditions are considered. So I'll quickly go through the methodology for frames. This report, there is a report that, that uh, concludes with the frame methodology that I'm pretty sure is available from ATC, 
there are a couple of calibration studies uh, underway, which I'll talk about later, that those uh, engineers need this methodology. So what does a procedure do? Well, and quickly, and this is small print because there's a lot of steps, what Jack already said, you somehow estimate the story drift from the site seismic demand, and that's uh, most easily done by uh, estimating a period somehow and getting the spectral uh, displacement. Uh, you then estimate the median drift demand. Now this whole procedure is probabilistic, unlike ASC 41. So you got a probabilistic demand and a probabilistic capacity of drift in the columns, which I'll go over later. So these are all medians. We estimate the median drift demand uh, on the columns in various ways. And then you estimate the median column drift capacity. And as I'll say later, you, you get that from this enormous database that is now available from all of the tests of columns that have been done since that first one that Jack talked about. Uh, there's a lot more now available. So then you obtain a rating for each column, uh, a measure of the probability of loss of gravity capacity. And this is simply done by knowing uh, what the drift capacity is of different columns in different situations. You measure that against the drift demand, and using structural reliability uh, theory, you can calculate what the probability of loss of gravity uh, carrying capacity is. You then combine those column capacities uh, to get a story rating. This is an innovative thing that Abby Lyle has come up with. I'll describe that later. Um, and then you do this for every story, and the highest story rating in terms of probability of collapse, turns out to be the uh, rating of the building. So now getting a little bit more specific, uh, we calculate the spectral displacement, very similar to ASE 41. We distribute that spectral displacement to each story uh, using uh, median uh, drifts. And as Jack so nicely already described, you, we did that by running many, many, many analysis of many, many different heights of buildings and different conditions of buildings and figuring out what the uh, story drift profile was uh, as a function of the average drift of the building. We call these alpha factors. So based upon some various characteristics of the building, you get an alpha and you multiply that out and you can get the story uh, drift. So we have, we think torsion is very important. So we have a torsional factor uh, where you amplify the drift at the story, uh, mostly of, of course to the outer columns. So we get a, a, finally get a drift affecting an individual column. We then estimate the effective rotation on the column by considering a column floor flexural interaction. So depending upon whether the beams or floor is very flexible or very stiff, you get a different amount of moment put into the column, and that's all taken into account. And so you finally get a drift that's affecting the capacity, uh, the drift capacity and vertical load carrying capacity of the column. Um, and we use this column testing database that's available uh, for the plastic rotation capacity and convert that plastic rotation to drift and then obtain a rating for each column uh, using structural reliability methods considering the median capacity and demands and all the uncertainties that, of course, the uncertainties we're estimating, but we can get the uncertainties of the column capacities pretty easily because we have the whole database. The other, the other uncertainties on the demand side are pretty much standard in the literature. Now we have the record-to-record -record, uh, uncertainty and other uncertainties uh, uh, relating to uh, demand. So when we combine those column uh, collapse capacities to get the story rating, uh, and it's been done, I'll explain later, using Monte Carlo simulations, and then we finally get the building demand. So let's go back over these a little bit more detail. Uh, how do we get the uh, period? Well, there are formulas around, but uh, there were no formulas really for the, uh, uh, what I would say, ASC 41 type pushover uh, period, they're mostly elastic periods. So this is a classic picture that was in the very first ATC 33 uh, for what the effective K and effective uh, period was using VY and DY. So we said, how, do, how can we approximate VY and DY? 
and uh, that, that was done, the VY was done by calculating the plastic story shear capacities in a simplified but onerous way. I mean, it takes a lot of calculation, but it's all spreadsheets. Uh, there's no nonlinear uh, considerations at all. And then uh, we assumed a structural yield drift based upon judgment or DY. So you get those two parameters and you, you can plug and chug and, and get a period. So how do we simulate that pushover curve? Well, you estimate the story, uh, you estimate a pushover uh, to get uh, that VY. So you get the plastic story shear capacity of every story here, V1, 2, 3, and 4. And then you get, uh, you put a rectangular triangular loading of unity. It doesn't make any difference what the actual value is in order to come up with uh, relative story shear demand. Uh, and then you compare that with the plastic story shear capacity. So you get a relative demand capacity ratio. And I keep saying relative because we don't really care what that load is. It's just the pattern that we're concerned about. And we can normalize it to anything. We happen to normalize it to V1. So therefore that DCR, story DCR is always one at the first level. And then in a typical building, it would go, it would be 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.6. I just made these up. Um, but that is a close way for a frame of estimating that pushover period because VY uh, is dependent upon the actual capacity of the frame uh, in a pushover analysis. So uh, VY is controlled by the weakest story. So if the weakest story turns out to be not the first level, for example, uh, if it's uh, the DCR, the second story is higher by one, because it's 1.1 instead of one, then that means that the pushover is being controlled by a yielding in the second level, and you can simply ratio uh, that VY by that, by that number. So, there's a, so VY equals uh, one over 1.1. So this is the way we get VY uh, from the plastic story capacities. Now, we did all this in order to get the period, but we figured out afterwards, kind of, that this gave us DCRs, relative DCRs of every story. And uh, when Jack Maley and his students were trying to figure out how to get the, how to distribute the drifts over the uh, floors, we figured out if there was a high DCR in an upper floor, then that's probably going to be a lot different uh, story drift. So he also used the DCRs in these calculations to set his alphas. So to estimate the story drift is just the, the classic uh, portal methods uh, of you know, the individual columns. Uh, but what, is it controlled by shear? Is it controlled by the moments at the ends? Is it controlled by the beam, uh, by the be weakness of the beams? Or it could be controlled by the joints. So you quickly go through all these different things and get a DP for each column. And again, it's a lot of calcs, but it's pretty much spreadsheet. And you simply can add up all those uh, uh, DPs of every column. And again, this is true whether it's a gravity column, a, a actual moment, uh, all these things, or I mean an actual gravity frame or a flexural uh, lateral force resistance system. Then it turns out there's a lot, this is the typical case Turns out if you're at the edge of the building or at the top of the building or at the bottom of the building, these things change. So we want to be we wanted to be consistent. Most engineers could figure out how to do this anyway, but in order to be consistent between buildings, we have given rules for what do you do at the first floor, what do you do at the roof, uh, if it's controlled by the joint, what do you do, and so on. So all these rules are in this methodology. Um, so once we get that by. Uh, up here, then we needed a dy, and we assumed 0.75% uh, of the height of the building as a uh, appropriate uh, strain for the for that point that we're looking for. And if you put those two things in and figure out what the slope is of the ke, you you come up with a equation which makes no sense because we've boiled it all down to uh, just the coefficient times uh, you know, w over dy and the height. So that's the, that is our effective period. 
So we got the effective period. We go back into a ASC 41, take the standard uh, formula for a single degree of freedom system, and come up with you know a uh, drift uh, uh, spectral displacement. And uh, then all we need to do is somehow relate that spectral displacement to each floor. So the individual story drifts, there's a formula, a couple of, the alpha is the important one, the betas are, are, dealing, with, uh, are dealing with special cases, like uh, if you have four column splices, that's basically going to form a pin and that's going to change your whole uh, drift of that story, so those are special coefficients that go in the table, but you have a table of alphas that has to do with the number of stories, and the ratio of a column beam flexural strengths, uh, Jack talked about a lot. We use that a lot as a parameter to study frames. And then a critical story is defined in various ways. It's certainly the first story or the story with the highest DCR. So then these are just factors that you multiply times the spectral displacement drift to get the drift of the story. As I say, the betas are penalties for special cases. And Jack already showed some of these pictures. This is just a sample of some of the trillions of runs a student ran to come up with what is an appropriate alpha under various cases. This is just the variable is this uh, strength, shear strength. And depending on what the shear strength is, you get slightly different coefficients. Uh, so as he pointed out, as he pointed out, you run a lot of these and you start to see a pattern and you say, oh, I can use two and a half or I can use two because there's all this record to record variability, but by the time you boil it all down, it's surprisingly consistent. So we get the drift demand on each column. Uh, we amplify that story drift for torsion and our torsion uh, methodology uh, was quite complicated to begin with. We've recently uh, simplified that a lot. Uh, but in any case, you're going to amplify the story drift uh, for torsion. And then you estimate the portion of the drift, uh, story drift, that's actually going to affect rotation of the column. And why would you have to do that? Well, because a lot of that story drift is taken out in the rotation of the beam system or the slab system or whatever it is at the top and the bottom. So we can do that by estimating uh, the relative strength of the uh, moment of the top and the, of the horizontal system in the column. So we got rules to do that. So you finally get down to where you have the drift that's actually affecting rotation on the column. Uh, so then, as I say, there is a rules for how much of this drift uh, affects rotation. Why do we want rotation? Well, the column database uh, for column for uh, gravity failure is based on uh, rotation uh, of the column, so we needed to get to there. Um, and this drift capacity we're looking for is the drift at which the column of interest will fail axially. So again, Jack set me up perfectly with saying P whiz columns are important. So we're not looking at side sway. We're not look, We're looking at where we think the column is going to lose axial capacity. And how do we how do we get that? Well, it's pretty much from ASE 41 rules because those rules were taken from the same database uh, that we're using. It's depending upon the way the column is reinforced and what the axial load on the column is. Um, we have to classify the column based upon the failure mode, and you'll recognize the table from ASC 41. You estimate the plastic rotation corresponding to the axial failure, and then you convert that plastic rotation to drift, at which point you can compare that to the drift demand uh, we've obtained on the demand side. So this is the table that you've seen. Uh, there are these various areas, uh, type, type little i and double little i and triple little i, depending upon what your shear strength of your column is and what, how the column is reinforced. So that just gets you into a bin, which leads you to understand what the drift capacity is from the column failure database. 
So then you get the median column drift capacity, uh, depending upon uh, whether you're in condition I, double I, triple I, and depending upon what your axial load ratio is and so on, and you finally get the plastic rotation capacity, the mean plastic uh, rotation capacity on the uh, far right of this table. You then go into the column database. This is just a simulation, but there are many, many column uh, failure points that uh, are inquired from uh, this uh, capacity or demand side, and you end up with uh, a final ro uh, rotation uh, for a me median rotation that will cause axial failure of the column. You convert that rotation to drift, which is pretty trivial, and you can uh, obtain a rating for each column, which is a measure of the probability of loss of gravity. Uh, uh, how is that done? And it's done by standard probability density functions, structural reliability. You got basically a bell curve for demand capacity, and you can figure out you know where they intersect, and uh, you can end up with that standard formula from structural reliability methods, um, including all the uncertainties on the demand side and the uh, capacity side. So that leads to, depending upon what your ratio of column capacity demand is, uh, a probability of failure, probability of loss of vertical collapse. We've simply put this on a numerical scale between uh, zero and one. Uh, so we call the rankings, rather than, rather than calling them percent or percent of failure, we're just given a numerical ranking. So 0.3 basically means that you have a 30% chance of loss of gravity uh, capacity uh, of that column given that drift. You get up to 0.99, of course, if you've heard it very high. We purposely cut off this at one decimal point because we don't think we're any more accurate than that. <laughs> Uh, we may maybe not be that accurate, but nevertheless, uh, again, we think we know that 0.5 is worse than 0.1, so uh, that's how we're doing that. So then, how do we get the story rating? <clears throat> this is a little bit more complicated. We, we have the rating of each column, so how does that relate to the overall collapse of the story, which is what we're after? Um, it depends, of course, on all of the, uh, all of the, ratings of the columns uh, combined, and uh, it's, this was done by a Monte Carlo simulation of realizations of column demand and capacity, and uh, you end up with random generation of many conditions using the average column rating as a parameter. So if you have, uh, you know, 100 columns, each of those are going to have a different rating, you simply take the average rating, and that was considered in these Monte Carlo, uh, and they're actually it turned out to be a fairly good pattern. The only, the only problem was if you had a lot of very high rankings and a lot of very low rankings, big differences in other words from the columns, everything started to fall apart a little bit. So there's penalties if you have a building that has uh, some real good columns and some real bad columns. But the criteria for the Monte Carlo simulation was that uh, we were looking for 25% uh, of the column, 25% of the column failed in the Monte Carlo simulation, we said the story was gone. Now that 25% could be 50%, 30%, 10%, could be anything you want, and we studied that. So it turns out that you, you, the band is quite small for what assumption you make. So uh, each of these is a curve using a different assumption in these Monte Carlo simulations. And it, it turned out we had chosen 0.25 to begin with, and we said, well, it looks like uh, the relationship doesn't change that much, so why don't we just stick with 0.25. So the story rating that we're currently using represents the probability of story failure, uh, and that's, that happens if we get 25% of the columns fail in gravity, probability-wise. Um, Column demand is uncertain, but assumed to be perfectly correlated for all columns in a story. Um, 
but there is a there is a correlation when columns are close together. So we're saying if one column fails, that's going to affect columns that are located near it. So there is a correlation factor in these Monte Carlo simulations uh, to take into account that uh, correlation. Okay. <laughs> So the correlation uh, was somewhat arbitrary, but we, we con uh, consulted with several probabilistic type people, and uh, this is the correlation uh, just based upon distance from one column to another, and after it gets to a certain uh, point of the uh, 0.5 of the maximum building dimension, it, it's, the correlation is almost uh, nothing, it gets down to 0.2. So then, Depending upon what your average column rating is on the left, and I'm sorry those uh, squares are supposed to be less than uh, guys, but they came out differently. So depending upon uh, what that average is, and of course we got two decimals there because if you average a bunch of numbers, you're going to get two decimals. So we have two decimals, but each of those leads to a single uh, rating for the story of one decimal. Uh, so that's your story rating, you find your worst one, and that's the building rating. So that's the basic methodology. However, when every time we kind of think we were finished, someone would some of the project management committee would say, well, you know, we didn't consider this, so we didn't consider that. We better add another bell or whistle. So, so we have beam column frames, uh, including short columns, uh, and we're considered with column collapse. We have slab column frames, both flat slab or waffle slab, and we're worried both about column collapse and punching shear collapse. So we can measure which of the two things is critical for the drift that we have under various conditions. And if punching shear collapse controls, then that particular column line is given a rating that's consistent with the other ratings, and it goes into the, the whole bin of calculation of the story uh, collapse probability. We also are dealing uh, or measuring inadequate joints, uh, particularly the corner columns that Jack talked about. If we have a corner column failing our criteria, that column line is assigned a relatively high probability of collapse without going through uh, the entire drift capacity uh, calculation. We also have, we also looked at some sample buildings and we entered, several of them had mezzanines. So we said, gee, we better do something about mezzanines because all our rules uh, that we made are not considering mezzanines. So we actually have a whole procedure. If you have a mezzanine, how do you calculate the DCRs in that case? Uh, so what kind of testing and calibration have we done? Uh, well, there's the approximate period formula that I gave you. We looked at uh, some formulas uh, that Chopra, from Chopra's studies, and we estimated the likely strength of his inventory based upon the time of the buildings were built using the code strength uh, criteria. And we, we looked like we were following that data pretty well, but a little bit higher uh, period, which is what we want because his periods were probably pretty much elastic and we wanted to be uh, that pushover period. Um, we also looked at the period formulas of the various frame heights in our own uh, IDA calculation. So once we get, did an IDA, we could circle back and come up with what the approximate period formula would give us versus what we actually uh, got by calculation. And um, you know, th that seemed also reasonable. Uh, Abby had her Colorado students used an early version of the method check clarity and we ended up with some good ideas from, from those students. Um, and we also checked uh, our final collapse probabilities versus the P695, that's another word for IDAs, uh, used in a development work and uh, we again had uh, what we thought was acceptable agreement. Uh, we also have some tests going on right now. Some of you are aware of this RFP on the street. Uh, Los Angeles Building Department, as was mentioned, has passed an ordinance. So they were very interested in this method. And we said, gee, we're sorry, we're not going to get it done by the time you want to use it. 
but they, they coughed up some money and said, well, we'd like to try it. So uh, we came up with, with, with an RFP that you can see that when it was submitted, uh, we have already selected seven buildings uh, that not necessarily in LA. They, by the time they finished, all they wanted was an LA engineer. Uh, you didn't have to have an LA building. Um, so that's gonna start, those tests are gonna start soon. And then FEMA has also included a similar calibration uh, in the ATC program. And uh, it turns out tomorrow, I think it's Friday, is when those uh, submittals are due. So you can run back Tonight and find a frame building and submit it uh, for us. Uh, it turns out, as everyone knows, it's hard to find a frame building. And then once you say, well, you better get the owner's approval to use it, it's even harder. And the perfect building, of course, is one that's been retrofit because then the owner is not worried about the liability anymore. Plus the fact the engineer probably has had a lot of studies on how what the vulnerabilities of the building are. So we can start checking whether these answers come out at least in an order that we think are uh, important. So mid-year 2016, we'll probably have some wall, uh, we'll have the wall methodol methodology ready to go, so we're hoping to do some wall buildings at that point. Now right now we're considering walls, and uh, we have not yet incorporated the wall buckling that Jack has described. I'm glad that he did that though, because that's been a concern of mine uh, uh, for how do walls affect the collapse. In past, in a lot of the uh, P695 studies, uh, when they were studying walls, they didn't really know how walls affected collapse, so they just said a drift line or a strain. They said when the wall strains XYZ, it's a collapse. And that's not realistic, and that's not what we're about in ATC 78. We're actually trying to figure out something a little bit more uh, accurate than that. So um, we all have decided that there are some conditions where a wall fails that it's going to lead to collapse, and that's what we're all about, trying to figure that out and to set rules up uh, for that. But anyway, <laughs> when we started the walls, I started to try to figure out what are all the cases that we were going to have to deal with. Uh, we have frame columns and beam slabs. That's where we're, we're, what we already have, and what the drift pattern and how we determine it, and what are we measuring in column slab behavior. Then you got some frames with incidental walls. Maybe they're little six-inch walls. At some point, we can just ignore them. So we've done some studies to try to figure out how much wall starts to affect the response. That's what Jack was saying. It turns out we found out it doesn't take very much wall to even out the drift over the whole over the whole building. But we also know that if a wall fails in shear, or certainly sliding shear, you're gonna end up with a soft story. It's not gonna be that rotation uh, over the whole building. So you got these wall-dominated frame cases, uh, and you got, you got always with the walls, you got the regular buildings, and much more common, the irregular buildings, both plan irregularities and vertical irregularities. That kind of uh, screws up our our nice analytical IDA studies where we just put a couple of nice walls in there, you're gonna to have to start putting walls that do strange things because that's what happens in real buildings. Then you, you get to a point where you start putting in more walls and less columns and all of a sudden you're going towards a bearing wall building at which point measuring how the columns collapse probably is not the right way to determine what the collapse probability is. So at some point we have to go to some other consideration of how does a wall behavior affect a collapse probability. And I, I'm seeing that we have one method there of considering the, the buckling. So we also have looked into a wall index that Meta Sozin invented many, many years ago, which is simply the area of the wall divided by the tributary floor of the building. Uh, in Chile and some other countries, they've used this as sort of a back check on their uh, codes for many years. But we've done a lot of studies trying to figure out if there is a wall index, enough walls that you just forget it. You're out of the system. You don't even have to go through this collapse probability. So that turns out to be more complicated than you think as well because you've got one big fat wall or four skinny walls is a totally different, you get a different answer. but. We're hoping that we're gonna just exclude some buildings right off the bat because the wall index uh, will be high enough. 
And then we have the special cases. We know we got discontinuous walls on columns. How does that fit into this whole system of cross probability for the whole building? Uh, you got the bearing wall, as I say, adequate uh, uh, wall index that's regular. We know we got perimeter punch walls. That's a whole different case, although it may not be in the end, but you've all seen them. There's, it's, it's an architectural feature where the architect has made all the perimeter walls concrete, put a bunch of openings in it, usually creates short columns, but that probably is a different, whether our standard procedure can handle that is unclear yet. And then, as somebody asked, everybody keeps asking us about infill masonry. Well, when, when I say walls are difficult, masonry is even more difficult because the ASE 41 gang can't even, uh, doesn't feel, feel comfortable with their uh, modeling of uh, masonry walls right now. So ATC 78 is not about original research, so we can't go out and create a, a new model for masonry walls. So we're sort of putting that as sort of last. I got some notes over here. Uh, note one is talking about this wall index. And here's a reference to his original concept that actually came from looking at, uh, looking at earthquake damage and having students go around and measure the, how much area of wall there was and trying to figure out whether there was a, he, he could predict collapse from that. Uh, so we're investing in that in a lot more uh, detail. Um, Note two is a, uh, the line between the frame behavior and the dominant wall behavior has, has to be defined. We've kind of done that with studies of uh, frames with adding wall strength and wall strength. So we're thinking that the wall methodology will have a, a binning process, uh, categorizing process right off the bat with some simple uh, calculations that would say you're either a frame uh, because you can either have, don't have any walls or the walls are incidental, or you're a, a wall-dominated frame which has a different set of rules, or you're a bearing wall building where the columns maybe not have that much category. And depending upon how you, what bin you're in, there might be different procedures for you to go through uh, for the rest of the document. One, uh, one definition that we've examined is the, um, is the yield strength plastic yield strength of the walls divided by the plastic yield strength of the walls plus the frames. So basically it's saying how much, how strong is the frame, how strong is the wall with respect to the total uh, strength of the building. Uh, problem, this works pretty good. The problem is that it takes a lot of calculation to get there. So if we want to bend buildings right at the first of the procedure, th this doesn't make any sense because you've already gone through all the calculations uh, that we're trying to avoid. But the preliminary indication is that this number can be as little as 15%. So if the wall has 15% of the strength of the total building, it's probably going to be wall dominated uh, if you're just looking at that uh, alpha being the same all over the building. So note three here is that the line between the buildings where the collapse is, is primarily controlled by column behavior and when does wall behavior come in? I've already mentioned that. We have to kind of figure out maybe there's something in addition to the wall buckling that Jack described. There may be some other kind of a wall failure, for example, sliding shear or something that's going to cause a soft story. And not necessarily the wall is going to collapse, but it's going to cause all the columns in that level to collapse because the drift will be way amplified. The actual collapse of the building due to the wall itself losing gravity strength is something that uh, nobody has dealt with very well. It, uh, it's being dealt with by this buckling, but that's a very local effect. So how does that translate to a story collapse is what is things that we're trying to, uh, trying to figure out. And finally, uh, discontinuous walls, we know that discontinuous walls, uh, we have them all over the place thanks to architects, and there's a column at each end if you're lucky, or there might be sitting on a beam or something. We know that is a potentially very dangerous problem, both in, but it changes both your deformation pattern of the wall, and if it collapses the wall, uh, if the column collapses, then you've lost that uh, wall. 
And ASC 31 has a test, but it's very conservative. Your, your columns have to take the plastic capacity of the, the moment capacity of the wall above, which often is kind of absurd. I mean, it's, 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 you can never, seldom can never do that. So uh, we thought about different ways of taking those columns at that level and somehow adding them into just the regular calculation of 25% collapse, but it's another uh, thorny issue that we have to deal with. So uh, what's the, what, what, what do we see the procedure when we're all done with the walls? Well, we think that much more for walls and for frames, the load path is very important. I mean, we don't we hardly say anything about load path in the frame methodology. We say you should think it, make it it's okay, but we don't really say how to do it. But you got walls in there, you got collectors, and you got diaphragms important and stuff. So we, we have to beef that up. Um, So then we're going to estimate the approximate frame and wall story strength somehow, maybe by area rather than strength. We want to bin these buildings into different categories, so we could go through different procedures. We've got to estimate the fundamental period somehow, and we're going back to looking at formulas. Uh, many formulas are available for periods. Uh, we haven't liked any of them, but maybe we can develop our own. Uh, we calculate the spectral displacement, then we distribute these drifts based upon the rules for each bin of the buildings, and then calculate the story rating, and the worst story rating is the building rating. So it's very similar to the frame methodology, but there's some twists in there because of what the walls are doing to us. So what are the conclusions here? The ATC 78 project's expected to complete a basic rapid evaluation method for over concrete buildings in 2016. And if we don't, you know, FEMA will probably say, that's enough years. <laughs> Your goose is cooked. Uh, a completely compatible methodology for bearing wall buildings and masonry in, infill buildings uh, may extend farther because the masonry is a real problem that uh, we can't solve by ourselves. Methodology expected to be capable of ranking buildings related to the probability of wall collapse with an engineering effort similar to ASC 31 Tier 2, which is ten to $15,000 kind of an idea, and as I say, LA was very interested in this because they could probably get, uh, they've already got their ordinance now, uh, they could somehow say there's an intermediate step, please everyone do this analysis, and they would get all these answers in for their 1,500 buildings and they could start to see, you know, whether there's some clear patterns. So that, that's the way we're thinking it would be used. It can also be used by individual offices. If you do a lot of concrete buildings and you run this on every building, you will start to get a feel for how, how bad something is relative to some other building. When you're really trying to measure collapse and not the ASC 41 component-based failures, uh, that's what you're trying to get away from.